Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, thank you for joining us this evening. We feel extremely privileged to host the pre-release screening of Cesar Chavez tonight and delighted to do so in such great company. I'd like to thank first my colleagues Paola, Patti, Rachel, Sophie and Alina with the Center's Film Series, the Mexico and Central America program and the events team for organizing this event, as well as our co-sponsors, the Initiative on Ethnicity, Migration, Rights, and the Boston Latino International Film Festival. We are especially honored to welcome Pablo Cruz, who is up there with his iPhone, <laughs> <laughs> and Diego Luna, who produced and directed Cesar Chavez, respectively. Bienvenidos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Oh, he was here. Sorry. <laughs> um, I will introduce Diego and Pablo properly um, after the screening and when we begin our panel presentation and Q&A. But um, as you begin to turn off your mobiles and all other recording devices, um, I will invite them to present the movie at this time. But let me emphasize that. We really need to have you turn off all electronic devices. I was told if somebody pulls out an iPhone, they will be pulled out of the auditorium because this is a pre-screening. So please, as the movie begins, make sure that you put them back in your bags. So Diego and Pablo, please join me. Hola, hola, thank you very much. Um, we are very privileged of having this opportunity not just to show you the film, but to discuss the film. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, how good you are, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> and <laughs> destroy egos. Uh, destroying egos, and that we wanna, we just want to get ready for the big <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, no, I have to say that this film means a lot to us. It's a uh, it's the first, we moved to the States with our company, we opened uh, an office in California, and we found this story and we thought this was the perfect story for us to start our journey in this country, of producing content in this country. And it's a story that hasn't been celebrated in film. It's a community that you can find, it's very difficult to find films that, that, that portray this, the, this community with all the complexity that it has. And it's just time for, for us to be represented in film. And uh, I realized I knew nothing about Cesar Chavez uh, when I started doing my research. And that's because there's a border between this country and Latin America that has fractured us and that has divided us and that keeps growing and growing. And this is an attempt to, to fight against that and make sure we are connected and we share stories. So thank you for giving us this amazing opportunity to share the film with you. Uh, not just the recording. Uh, if The recording is important, and that's not because of us, because in fact, uh, soon we, we in Mexico, it's very different. In Mexico, the film probably is already out in the black market in Tepito. <laughs> But here in this country, it matters, so it's not, I'm not kidding, these guys will take you out of the cinema, so it's, uh, uh, but not just that, if you don't like the film, promise you won't say anything till March 28th, please. Uh, it's not a joke. It's not a joke, if not, <laughs> they're gonna take you out if you don't say yes, yes, I accept, no. Well, we come out on the 28th of March, uh, and uh, this is the first, first, the beginning of our promotion, and uh, thank you for being here with us and sharing this important night with us. Thank you. Well, obviously, you know, we're just preparing ourselves for our children to get a scholarship here, so... <laughs> that's why we started here the promotional tour of our film. But that, more surprises to come. Stay please at the end of the film. The main reason why we're here is because we want to hear what you think and uh, there's nothing we can do to the film anymore but your opinions always matter. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
let me um, go ahead and introduce them formally, as well as Professor Gans, who's just arrived. Pablo Cruz, producer of the film, studied film theory at the London College of Printing and having previously obtained a BA degree from the New York School of Visual Arts. He's a founding member of, um, and producer of Canana, a company he established alongside partners Gael Gar Garcia Bernal and Diego Luna in 2005, and which focuses on making Latin American films that have an international appeal. In 2012, Canana expanded operations into the US as Canana LA, which strives to offer entertainment with social underlining themes for the Latino community living in the United States. During its first year, Pablo completed production of Cesar Chavez in collaboration with participant media. Currently, Canana LA is working on Back Home with, the Fusion, with Fusion, a joint venture between ABC and Univision. Over the past six years, Pablo has produced documentaries and over 13 films, including I'm Gonna Explode, Miss Bala, Deficit, and Sin Nombre. Along with Diego Luna, Gael Garcia Bernal, and Elena Fortes, Pablo in 2005, a non-profit organization that produces a traveling documentary film festival in Mexico. The festival has brought over 900 documentaries to communities across the country in the last seven years. The film festival has expanded to other countries and will be in the United States in September of this year. Let me also welcome formally then Diego Luna, who began his professional career at the ripe age of seven, and at 12 he had made his debut in television, has then, since then worked in film, TV, and stage performances. He has lent his talent to over 30 films, both Mexican and foreign. Most notably, he is known for his roles in Itumama Tambien, directed by Alfonso Cuaron, whom you may have um, remember from, from last night, actually. <laughs> Rudo y Curzi, where he reunited with Gael Garcia Bernal under the direction of Carlos Cuaron. Milk, directed by Gus Van Sant, and most recently in Elysium, directed by Neil Blomkamp. Diego has also been part of such theater productions as The Película and El Cántaro Roto with the Compañía Nacional de, Atro, de Teatro, with whom he received a Premio Revelación Masculina 96-97 by the Theater Critics Association. In 2008, he produced and acted in The Good Canary, directed by John Malkovich. At the 2007 Tribeca Film Festival, Diego met, made his directorial debut with the documentary on boxer, Mexican boxer Julio Cesar Chavez. The Mexican box office success Abel became his second project behind the camera and his fiction feature debut, which premiered at the Sundance Fil Film Festival in January of 2010. Abel also played at the Cannes International Film Festival, LA Film Fest, San Sebastian International Film Festival, and others. Following the success of Abel, Diego turned his attention to the US market and in 2012 began production of Cesar Chavez, which is set to hit the theaters in, um, on March 28th, I believe, and which we have just had the great privilege of watching. And last, but by no means least, let me introduce Professor Marshall Gans, who is a senior lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and who also has a really great story. He entered Harvard College in the for, uh, fall of 1960, and in 1964, a year before graduating, he left to volunteer as a civil rights organizer in Mississippi. In 1965, he joined Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, and over the next 16 years, he gained experience in union and community issues in political, political organizing, becoming the director of organizing. During the 1980s, he worked with grassroots groups to develop effective organizing programs, designing innovative voter mobilization strategies for local, state, and national electoral campaigns. In 1991, 
in order to deepen his intellectual understanding of his work, he returned to Harvard College. And after a 28-year leave of absence, he completed his undergraduate degree <laughs> in history and government. He was awarded later a master's in public administration by the Kennedy School in 1993 and completed his PhD in sociology in 2000. He teaches researchers in rights and leadership, organization and strategy in social movements, civic associations and politics. Let's welcome all three of them. I don't know how this works. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So what I thought we could do tonight is I will only ask one question of uh, Professor, uh, Professor Gans and then of Pablo and Diego and let them talk, uh, res answer the question, but then add any comments that they might want to add um, on that and then open it to Q&A. We have about half hour, so yeah, a little bit over half hour. Um, so we'll start with my question and then we'll move on to the audience. So, Professor, um, let me find it because I, if I read it, I'm gonna do it better. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your own work and your experience in the movement and how you live that and how it informed your work and also expand a little bit as to how you see that, what we've just seen, um, perhaps shaped the landscape today in political organizing and any other kind of organizing, actually. Okay. <laughs> That's a could be a very expansive question. I we have half hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, first, I, I, I want to I wanna thank you for the opportunity to review the film and to um, reflect on it and to offer comments. Um, and, and I will respond, but I do have to say it's a problem uh, because um, when you've lived something and you've been in it, um, your perception of it, uh, is very different than um, than a view presented in a film later on. Very different. Um, I think it's really challenging, uh, really challenging. Um, I think the Milk film uh, comes close to achieving that with respect to Harvey Milk and uh, and the gay movement. Uh, this film made me sad. Um, Caesar was so much more. Uh, than, than almost a cartoon presented here. Um, he was not a public speaker. He, uh, public speaking was not his thing. Uh, that he, he actually didn't like public speaking. Um, his power was relational. Uh, he was a relationship builder. He, he, um, and, and that was part of his genius was his capacity to weave together relationships of very diverse people and communities and institutions. Um, he was never alone. Um, he was always teaching someone or accompanying someone or someone was accompanying him. He was never alone. Um, he was um, a strategic genius. Uh, his capacity for creativity, um, meaning um, <laughs> He used to talk about, he used to love to um, kill two birds with one stone and keep the stone. Uh, he was a good pool player. Uh, he really liked carom shots in pool because that's not a direct shot, it's an indirect shot. And uh, he, uh, he had the street smarts that then be turned into, through study and training and hard work, a tremendous uh, strategic capability. And, um, you know, and, well, we don't see that. He was a learner. You know, I mean, you know, he studied the lives of the saints. He studied Gandhi. When I met him, he was studying Winston Churchill. He was reading Churchill's books because he wanted to understand Gandhi's opponent. Uh, he, he read um, books like manuals and because he had a deep curiosity about how the world worked and all the diversity in it and what it was. Um, he was a cultural uh, artist. 
uh, because he understood how to weave together the Mexican traditions, the, the, the Catholic tradition, the revolution tradition. This was a Chicano-led movement. I mean, in terms of Caesar and Dolores, it was not Mexican immigrants that were actually in the leadership, Gilbert. Um, but then all the other threads of the civil rights movement, uh, the labor movement, uh, the, 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 re the religious organizations, um, all of which played a major role in this effort in large part because of his capacity to figure out how to manage all that diversity and all those different interests and create this space of autonomy within it. And he was an organizer above everything else. And an organizer never does anything that isn't strategic. Uh, it's never like, oh, let's have a march. I mean, that march was timed, you know, from March 17th, 1966, to, to follow from the Senate hearings because the press would be there the whole thing, um, everything was thought out in how is it going to build the organization? How is it going to build the movement? Um, and so the strategic backdrop to some of the events we saw were really where his gifts were. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, uh, and the movement, was a, the movement was a very dramatic one. Uh, it, it certainly had all its ups and downs. It went on for, for many, many years. There was a core of maybe 100, 200 people who actually sustained it uh, through the whole thing, but it would grow. But the events that we saw um, were punctuations in a rhythm that was quite different. Um, it was a long periods of like, oh my God, is this going to happen or not? And then breakthrough would happen. But it wasn't just, it wasn't just, didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of strategic planning and calculus and, and, and scheming and plotting and all the rest of it. Um, so I don't know, that, that makes me sad. Um, and uh, because uh, the significance of this movement, I think, was, uh, was great in terms of the lives of farm workers, which we don't really learn how, what effect it had on farm worker lives. We don't really learn that. We, we, we hear some words about it. We don't. The daily lives of farm workers were transformed for a period of about 15 years. Uh, and we, we don't. But it also fueled the Chicano movement. It fueled the, the, the connection with the young people in East LA in 1968 that did the school walkouts and how that bridge was made. And it, it had a big impact there. It fueled progressive politics, certainly in California, for many, many years. Not because of one guy, but because of all the people that were trained in organizing through that whole operation of the boycott and the strikes and all the rest of it. So, um, so that's why I'm sad, uh, because that's the story that I would hope would be told. It's the story I try to tell my students. Because for me, this is about teaching. Uh, there are lessons here that are incredibly important for this generation of people who are trying to create change to learn. And I wish those lessons came through. Yes, persistence matters. Yes, passion matters. But all the rest of it matters a whole lot too. And so I've taken more than you asked me, but um, you know, it's, it's 16 years of a person's life, you sort of have some thoughts about it. And, <laughs> uh, and for me, I, well, just a lot, you asked me the, at the beginning, for me, I'll just say that, that I grew up in Bakersfield, uh, which is uh, near Delano, and my father's a rabbi there, my mother a teacher. And, uh, but I got my education not here at Harvard, I got it in Mississippi, uh, when I learned about race, power, and politics in America, and went back and met Caesar just after I'd gotten back to uh, Bakersfield. This was like in October 65. And I came with Mississippi eyes to see the, see the world I hadn't seen before about race, power, and politics. Uh, another community of people of color, the same uh, political uh, limits, uh, economic limits, the history of segregation in California, that you know Mississippi was not an exception. It was an example of America that needed changing. And uh, Caesar was a teacher, a mentor, uh, a friend for many years. Um, and, but, and, and, and he taught so many of us. And, and a part of, that's part of what makes me sad is that the us is kind of missing. Uh, all the people whose lives he really interacted with, not his family. His family was there, that was part of it. But this is a story seems told more by his family than by the public Caesar 
who was the gift to the to the farm worker world and to the uh, you know to the community and the world of change in America. So um, yeah, so I'll stop with okay. that. Okay, let me just actually not let you stop, but for a minute go back, go back. Um, it's gone get the picnic. To, I, I, no, I, because I, just as for you it was sad for me, and I hope for many others, I was happy to learn even about it, and I can understand how the proximity of the experience makes you a different viewer of, of it all. Um, just like you came back to college 28 years later, mm -hmm. if you could go back in time, what would you have advised the union as an organization to do differently? Oh. Is, is there anything that now in retrospect you think, hmm, no. Oh. In the strategy, that's, that's what I'm thinking no, about. No, see, see, that's part of the deal. It's like um, strategy is very unique to particular times and circumstances and places. It's contextual. And, and Caesar had a grasp of context that was really powerful. Uh, that's why the Catholic bishops, they were the ones that mediated the contract at the end there. It was mediated by the U.S. Catholic Conference, uh, by the bishops committee. It didn't just come out of, out of nowhere. Uh, the relationship to the labor movement and Walter Ruther and being able to navigate those politics, which were very complicated and complex, were crucial to creating the space in which the union could survive. Dealing with the Teamsters Union, which is nowhere in there, there, there were our nemesis for, um, we fought with the Teamsters from 1966 to 1970, and again from 1973 to 77. Uh, uh, they were in alliance with the growers, uh, and we were fighting with them all over the, all over the place. Um, so, you know, how you survive, how you, see, what, what Caesar did, I, I think, you assemble a set of people who've got the commitments and, and the diversity of experience, and I really want to emphasize that, to be able to creatively respond to the challenges with a deep understanding of the context within which you're operating. That's one reason he never went anywhere alone. He was always getting coached on what was happening or teaching somebody. He was immersed with other people in how he did stuff and paid attention and listened. And so, you know, strategy develops from that. And so, you know, you go back and, and try to give advice. No, I mean, it's amazing what was achieved. I think it's tragic, ultimately, that it didn't sustain. I think it's tragic that the conditions of farm worker lives today are, if anything, worse than they were when we began this effort. I think that's tragic. And, and, uh, and I don't think it had to be that way, but that's another story. Um, but for this period of time and, and for these years, I think that... Uh, but you know, look, what am I going to say? I was part of it. I'm going to say that it was stupid. No, uh, you know, no, but it was, it was an exciting, um, creative experience. And, uh, part of it, the diversity again, when, when the growers would do something evil, <laughs> uh, we would get together and Caesar had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, sometimes he would, we all went to see The Godfather together, I have to say. And there was a whole period of time in the farm workers when everybody was playing some character in The Godfather movie. Uh, there was a humor and, and a contentiousness that brought out a kind of creativity that we figured out stuff like these boycotts and how to deal with Nixon and how to deal with, uh, you know, the night uh, Robert Kennedy was killed Caesar wasn't driving around in his car somewhere. We'd been doing the get out the vote in East Los Angeles that won that primary for him. Non-citizens, Mexican non-citizens, farm workers went to East LA. We took about 200 people. We turned out the Chicano vote in East LA. I mean, we voted like 87% in precincts in East Los Angeles in the primary election, never happened. We won that primary for him that night. We're at the Ambassador Hotel where he was assassinated. Caesar went home early, but I mean, it's those, the drama of the real life is where the deal is. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Let me now turn it to Diego and um, Pablo. And <laughs> Sorry, guys. I <laughs> 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 um, 
So now I have to ask you, and this question is going to sound very differently after <laughs> we've, but why did you pick this story? <laughs> um, no, and seriously, you, you spoke a little bit before we screened the, the movie about your hope that this story would be heard because it hadn't been told in film. And I'm sure there are many other stories that hasn't, haven't been told in film. So if you can tell us a little bit how you came about it, how you chose it, what inspired you, what challenges you faced, and then if you'd like to respond to <laughs> Professor Gans, then we're going to open it because, believe it or not, we now have 15 minutes. <laughs> And yeah, I'm going to take 20, so. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to start the other way around, because, uh, uh, I, or, or I guess by answering this, I'll, I'll, you said something, and I believe it's true. It's, uh, it sounds like the, this is the story told by the family. Yeah. And uh, it's completely true. It's the... It's the story told by the eyes of the kids of the family, of the, and there's it's it's not a coincidence that it ends with a, with a conversation between Fernando and Cesar, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I I think you, it's it's very difficult to ask a film to to pay respect to a movement of so many and to inform and to communicate how uh, how things happen it's very at the end it's very subjective because it depends on who's behind the camera and what matters to to the one telling the story i after going through all the um, the research and after I mean, I can I can show you. We have a computer full of <laughs> forty-five hours of how the thing with the Teamsters happened and when they turn uh, about the the whole relation with different churches, the whole thing about him. There's some I loved when you said when you said about him reading because there's like a a very boring. Uh, two-minute scene of him reading Gandhi in a shack and everyone looking at him saying, what the... F no, I was... Oh, I'm not in the right place, right? What is this guy doing do, doing reading in the shacks, you know? And, and, and then him talking about what he was reading to others and talking about nonviolence. And, and the problem is that then you have to do an hour and 45-minute film that need to be interesting, uh, that need to keep your attention. And you cannot be thinking about the audience when, but you can be thinking about yourself, you know? And to me, what makes, or at least from all the interviews, what made him a unique person is someone that is willing to give away something I'm not willing to do, which is being next to my kids being there looking at them growing up for anything, you know? I don't know if I would be able to do it. And uh, and when I sat down with Helen, which, yeah, happens to be the, the wife, and uh, she told me about that. She told me about the conversations they had about him not being there and the kids not having... The kids basically having the image of a father on his brother, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or, or, uh, and, and not him. And I remember getting out of that interview already with my mind set on what film I was going to make. Uh, I, I, I just hope one film starts not just a reflection, but a, a necessity of finding out uh, what happened back then, who they are, and detonates not just one or two other films, but detonates documentaries and discussions and things like this. Because... Again, it's, it'll be very unfair to ask a film to pay tribute to all of this, but definitely it's quite interesting and, a, and an interesting paradox that it's a, two Mexicans and a Mexican company, the ones that managed to put a film together that they've been trying to put together for 20 years. And it's sometimes this, is, this happens because it's, it's so present still. This is still so fresh for so many that it's difficult uh, to, 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 to achieve, you know? Those who were part of the movement, many tried to do the film, they couldn't. Uh, m many tried to approach the family and they never got their support. 
And suddenly these 30 year olds that happened to, I mean, I was born. <laughs> in, you're, 40. Uh, you're what? 40. You're 40. <laughs> you're old. Uh, these, I, I was born in 79 and I met Cesar. The first image I remember about Cesar is him in a, in a box, wood box made by his brother the, and carrying by tons of farm workers that happened to be Mexican. I was 14, 15 years old and I remember that image saying, who's that guy and why is he in a wood box? And, uh, and, and, and it was because I had a kid and my, my son was born in California uh, four, five years ago. I realized I wanted to do a film for him and I said, well, I have to recognize and accept that I have a Mexican-American in my family. Uh, I have to tell a story about a community. <laughs> I don't know much, you know, because we, we've allowed that border to divide us and to, to fracture us as communities. We don't share stories. Uh, uh, we in Mexico know very little about the Mexican-American experience. Mexican-Americans know very little about the, the Mexican experience today. There is a lot of prejudice. And we've allowed that wall that keeps growing to, to, to separate us. And, and this was an attempt to bring us together. Um, I've, I've, I've sat down with... Uh, Till now with uh, obviously all the family, all of those who are working in the union, with Dolores, with... And it's, it's interesting, I've never done a film that matters so much to people. Normally no one gives a shit. Uh, <laughs> you, you come out and you, well, I, I dream with this character. This time it's not like that. This time the, it's a connection with something. And I just, my only answer is that uh, I, I told the story from the perspective that mattered to me, but I really hope we become part of something bigger because uh, it's, to me, it's very sad that today there's even a discussion about, a, or there's even a debate about a, 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 an immigration reform. Today it's, it's, it's absurd that we're even thinking that, 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 uh, that there, there is some way to be against it. Uh, to me, it's stupid to live in this world where people that are, you know, feeding this country can barely feed their families, and that we, we have allowed this to happen. And I think, well, why there's no film of Cesar Chavez? Because we're allowing all of this hypocrisy to happen, you know? And uh, I don't know. I, I cannot excuse myself from anything. I try to do a film about a, I heard that that Cesar was, his best tool was listening, that he wasn't, I, I don't think we portray a really good speaker. Uh, he's, I mean, if you see, so eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in fact, he, he, he's, he, he's not the typical or the stereotype leader that grabs a microphone and, and, and brings a, a, a place quiet and uh, uh, his Spanish is kind of broken and, uh, uh, but he's a great listener and uh, I always thought, well, the thing is, this is an, the story of a normal guy, a guy that can be here and nobody will notice, uh, but that did an extraordinary thing. Uh, which is he brought confidence to a community that was broken, that was in fear, that was uh, that that had no confidence. And uh, I'm just happy we're generating debate with the film. I did it because I think I truly think in what he says at the end, uh, change is never gonna come from from those who are operating corporations, they're never going to go like, well, you know what, we're making too much money, let's make less. Uh, it makes no sense, we're hurting the world. No, that's not happening. I come from a place where politicians are... Teachers here. <laughs> a few are teachers here, that's true, but... Uh, <laughs> but But the, they're, they're working for the term, you know? They're working to put the medal on. And, and I, if, if there's only one around I can believe in, it's in people, it's in, in us taking 
control and that's what I why I did this film because this is people as you said not throwing the stone straight and that's why I focus on the the boycott, the action of actually going around and talking to consumers and finding out there's parents like you, and it's a, then it's a mother and a mother talking about child labor, and there is a father and a father saying, well, I have to be 14 hours in the fields and I have no time to see my kids or feed them. Uh, and it's about people people getting together with others and, and raising the voice at the same time. And to me, that was the message to be sent and that transcends this country, Latin America, the, uh, that applies anywhere else, uh, anywhere in the world, sorry. Uh, that if we don't get involved, change will never come. No? And to me, that was the idea behind it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Pablo is going to then uh, probably get the first question. So let me open it for questions. Um, I'm going to hear from the 40-year-old here. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> you think it'll make more sense? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I want to add quickly okay. that. And, and, you know, we, we had a very interesting relationship with the family. Of course, you know everybody. Mark Rosman gave me notes that were larger than the script itself. And of course, Paul Chavez and the whole family was always involved from day one. In fact, I guess the reason why we convinced them that we were the right company to make the film was precisely because of our distance. Um, because we were not Hollywood, we were not Chicano, we were not Mexican-American. We were somebody who saw the story universal. And they were ready to make the sacrifice that it hurts you so much or saddens you, which is the distance. And I think that it's very important to make it an international film. And that is a little bit what our chore was to them. And you know, we press it to you as well, which is the safe distance of what just Diego mentioned, which is to have the personal story run the show in a way. Uh, because otherwise, if it's so particular and so anecdotal, it could become a thing that is just for us and take it to a place where it's not something that a Russian person would like to see or a Chinese person would like to see. And some of the reflections that we came through were exactly that. You know, who is Cesar Chavez, a human? And what happened to his son and how that relationship happened? So it was just a very safe distance that we came into the project with. And hopefully the audience agrees with us that that is something that maintains the audience and you and everybody who's watching it as a universal story and that anybody here can relate to our Asian friends here or African Americans or even just a normal you know, Anglo-Saxon folk who says, you know, my father ne was never here. And, uh, you know, why, why did he sacrifice my time with him for something bigger? And I think Caesar explains it very well, and that's what he managed to achieve. All right, great. So now, yes, we're going to open it. Let's um, just remember that a question usually ends with a question mark and is brief. Um, so with that, where is the first question? Ro? Si? Yes. Uh, Ali? Can you ask people to say who they Hello. are? Yes, can you please say um, who you, your name and whether you are at school or whatever? My name is Rosario Ubert, and I'm a graduate student in literature, in Latin American literature. And Pablo very much anticipated my question, because I was going to ask about paternity in general in the film, and particularly in the relationship between the character of John Malkovich and his son. Mm -hmm. So we see both in Chavez and his son and Malkovich strong immigrants with a big sense of fight whose sons are born kind of in the comfort of American culture and just don't get what their parents are after. So if you could talk a little bit more about the question of paternity and immigration and generations in the US in general. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Very <laughs> <laughs> funny. Um, it is, at the end, that's uh, <coughs> it, going back to making a, a universal film. At the end, it's, I think it's, it's as simple as that. It's just that it's, it's, it's parents fighting for their sons, but just 
one forgot that there is other parents around in the, in the process, you know. Uh, and uh, but at the end, what motivates things, and it's again who who makes who who makes them succeed who makes uh, how did they get the attention of a country and then other countries because at the end it's the same thing it's mothers suddenly choosing not to buy something and they're part of a boycott and they're part of something bigger at the end that moves us all i think you know, at least from now from my perspective i have a 5 year old and a 3 year old and if they were not here i wouldn't be here and if I, if i did this film is because of them and if i want to do another one is because of them and if i if if i wake up in the morning is because of them you know so it's i think it's as simple as that and uh, i didn't i think in an issue like this, it's very easy to to be black and white and to say there's the, there was a bad guy. So obviously there was a bad guy. But the bad guys are fighting also for something they believe in. And in fact, the bad guys sometimes they, you know, if 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 you would see the film just from their perspective, you might you, you might be his, you know friendly to him and you might feel you're in, in front of someone you respect. You know, it's it's it's. I think the big issue, the big monster to fight is indifference, you know, because once you have the information, we're, we're not normally bad people. We don't normally want to hurt our neighbors or, you know, it, many times it's because we don't know. Many times it's because we don't want to know. Many times, and, and I think that's a big, the big fight that these guys did and that's a big fight film can do, uh, which is film can bring you specific stories about parents about fathers and sons and 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 then make you sensible to something that you probably didn't know existed and suddenly you're going to do something you know and uh, and it's uh i think that's a big thing and he he says it it's about going out and telling personal stories face to face and uh to me that's that's the strength of what i do and that's why i do it uh if I tell you right now there's more than 100,000 people being killed in the last eight years in my country, probably it's going to be a number that obviously is uncomfortable, And uh, but in 10, 15 minutes, that's it, you'll forget. But if I tell you the story of a kid that lost his father and now has to work at nine years old because the mother has to support a bigger family and I today and show you pictures about them and tomorrow you're gonna care about the the world we're living in mexico so that that that's what i think they 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 knew how to do uh but they have to give a they have to sacrifice the most valuable thing a father can have which is actually looking at your kid walk for the first time talk for the first time go to school happily get to the university, being here the day he, it matters to him, you know, and not many are willing to do that. There's a question up there. Yeah. Hello, my name is Sandy Placido. I'm a PhD student here in American Studies. Thank you so much for making this film. It was excellent. I think it was a wonderful introduction. I was struck by details such as El Marcriado, the theater scenes from Teatro Campesino Religion. I think you actually did an excellent job of really showing these details, women, uh, Cesar Chavez's wife like being the first to be arrested. I think it was great. Um, I especially liked the emphasis on the international elements, so when Cesar Chavez goes to the UK, as well as this kind of idea of the undocumented workers from Mexico also being part of the union. Um, so I guess my question was, because I saw a lot of details in the film that surprised me, others I had heard about. In the making of the film, were there moments where you were surprised by something you learned in an interview or in your research? <laughs> See, yeah, <laughs> a lot, uh, many, yeah. you know, we were, we were obsessed through a process of getting everything inside the script, you know? There's a line about everything. There's a line about the Teamsters. There's a line about this. There's a... And suddenly, we were reading a script that had so many references to something that didn't develop, you know, in anything. And then we said, let's, let's, let's forget about that. But then we went out to shoot in the fields. And uh, in the fields, we found so many people that were around back then or the, that were kids that had something to do, to the point that uh, 
we in the um, see I can say this without going to jail. I don't know what you're going to Lo say. de los campos, sí, no, sí. <laughs> if not, no, I'm please. sure there are lawyers here that can help us. Uh -huh. Okay, so we, we, we arrive to a location in Mexico and I say, this place is perfect. We, the gatekeepers and everyone were like, oh, Diego, well, cool, you're going to shoot here, perfect. We got a location. A, a week after, we got a message from our location manager that we could not just shoot inside, but we couldn't shoot anywhere around uh, because it, w it would be dangerous, you know? And we were like, what? <laughs> Why? And then we started investigating and uh, we got to the page of that piece of land that they sell not just grapes but many other things and then this company said we moved to Mexico to change the life of many in 1974. Uh, suddenly we go, 1974, the boycott. Uh, I mean, wait a second, who's we? So basically we were, we were going to shoot in the land of the, the grower we we're talking about in the film. And obviously, so it was the most authentic you can get, you know? The grape was going to be real, uh, the grape. <laughs> that, that he was boycotting uh, uh, and we couldn't shoot there. But, so suddenly you realize how everything is connected. The other day we were in, in Washington on a screening in Capitol Hill and, and the, there was, yeah, important people, powerful people, senators, representatives, and, and we were talking and showing the film and you can see in their faces that they all knew because of this story they have a seat there, you know? It's as, as close as that. And, uh, and we had one day to close our, uh, you know, there was a moment, I'm gonna say another one really quick, see, I have time. Uh -huh. No, this one, no. An actor, <laughs> we, were, we were doing a scene that is not in the film about another of the martyrs, uh, and when, when they tell Caesar and everyone in the team he died, and, uh, and I saw an actor on the phone I'm not gonna say the name, but uh, I saw an actor on the phone just when I was gonna say action. And I was like, wait, wait, wait a second, what are you doing? And then he says, it didn't happen this way. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. I, I wasn't walking next to him. I was walking behind him, talking to this. And I go, wait a second, we're doing a film here. What? So in the other line was the real character. The actual character saying, no, wait, don't do it that way. You know, <laughs> that kind of, and, and and it was, it was suddenly affecting all of us because you have to forget about it and you have to remember why you're there. Otherwise, you do a documentary. Otherwise, you go and you grab natural, I mean, natural footage from the time and recordings and you put it together and you do a documentary. But when you do a film, you have to forget about that. But it, with this one, it was very difficult because there's a need for this film everywhere, at least everywhere I go. You know, Mexico, California, everyone had a connection so strong to this film. And everyone wanted it one way and wanted one story to be out. And, and, and many of them are alive, but they all have families, friends. And he, he was, oof, he was, he was like four months of no sleep. There is a documentary, uh, Caesar's Last Fast, that was shot yeah. at Sundance, um, which uh, is a documentary, and I understand a quite good one. Did you like it? For those that, that are interested in it. Nah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a question here in the purple sweater and then um, back. So, is that here in the blue? No, back here, down here. There's a few questions. Do we have another four hours to yeah, stay here? Yeah, we can stay. <laughs> you have to eat, we're fine. <laughs> oh, but uh, so, I can... Let's take this question and take the next one, and then we'll answer them together, okay? My name is Albert Maldonado. I'm a student at Harvard Divinity School. Thank you for coming, all three of you. And um, first, a comment. I was really glad uh, the, the, the bits and pieces that you put of religion uh, in the film, because the Chicano movement is remembered as a secular militant nationalist movement that advocated the threat of violence. And, and it remembers Cesar Chavez as that, as a militant activist, and he was not that. He was a nonviolent activist. Um, but there's also a lot of things of religion that were not in the film, such as the priests that were at the same table when they were signing the mm -hmm. documents, uh, such as Cesar Chavez shaming the Catholic Church to get involved in uh, church, giving a sermon. 
Um, so I, I would like to ask, um, how did you decide what pieces of religion to put in there and what pieces to keep out? <laughs> uh, you come from films that we normally kill the priest on them, but <laughs> we allowed ourselves. <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh, I think. To me, that his position, the complexity of his position, first of all, in the personal aspect of, of religion, is the fasting. You know the big difference between a fast and a hunger strike. That to explain it, compl I mean, the whole information is there, but you can get out also saying he, he did a hunger strike, uh, which is a big, big, big mistake because he didn't. Uh, and and that, that tells you the, com the complexity of, of how he saw things and what faith meant for him. But then he, the only thing I wanted it is that to say that he managed to got many, many leaders of religion around his movement and, and supporting the movement. How he managed to do it, well, there was no, no time to tell, to say it, you know. Uh, the complexity of, of, of the man is, is quite a, an amazing thing. Um, he, he tries to explain to the brother that he's doing the fast He's not doing a hunger strike to make you do something. He's doing a fast because he wants to purify himself. He wants to go to a process of, 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 of rejecting who he is at the moment because he's part of something he doesn't want to be part of. If you react, that's good news. If you don't, I don't care because this is a personal thing that I'm gonna do by myself, and I I invite you to join me. You know, uh, and I kind of love the position of, of, of it, uh, even though uh, I I don't know if 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 he was completely understood at the time. Uh, but then he's so far from from the the stereotype of 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 of, of a mexican american that this country has portrayed in film and in television you know this is this guy is a vegetarian he does yoga he reads gandhi he he, he you go through his music uh, and and it's most of it is jazz you know, and you would expect a guy with a tequila and rancheras and having a, 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 a chorizo burrito, but he would organize a carne asada for all of the people in the in the union, and there's tons of pictures of of him cooking meat, you know, uh, at the same time, and. Uh, how to tell all of that in a film? <laughs> I think if you go then and read about him and investigate about him, and if this film can help us detonate the necessity of this community to be portrayed in cinema and in to, to be represented, uh, one day there'll be a chance to talk about all of those very specific things. But we, ha I, I was I was thinking about when it was the last time there was a film about this community that was a success. And since Selena, I cannot think about it. And that was many years ago, <coughs> many, many years ago. And, uh, and it's ridiculous. It's absurd that this community is not represented and celebrated, you know? Could, could I just, just add, his expertise was flautas. Las flautas. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was what he <laughs> loved to actually do, the flauta sale. Uh -huh. uh, but just on the fast, I just wanted to add, when Caesar shared with everyone he was starting his fast, um, then right away a team was assembled, which I was part of, uh, whose mission was to go out and organize. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my job was to go around to farm worker communities around the state and explain why Caesar was ayunando. And because everybody was freaked out. Uh, no, dale a comer. It's like you know, we need him to be strong. And, and so my, my point is that the fast was uh, it was uh, an authentic act of commitment. I appreciated your distinction between hunger strikes and, and fast. I think people get that very confused. Fast being directed, but a fast is directed at your own people. And it was very much a challenge to that community. And our job as organizers was to go around and turn that into reality. So, so I'm saying there was intentionality. It wasn't just like, I'm gonna stop eating and then let's see what happens. 
uh, Manuel <coughs> and Richard and others, boom, we went right to work doing our job organizing. And see, it's, that's, that's the part. There was an intentionality and a strategy to everything. It's really important for people to understand that. This stuff doesn't just happen. Uh, and, and, and his gift was combining the authenticity that you described with the intentionality and strategic purpose that, is, that produced these kinds of results. And the fast is a really good example of that. Every night there was a, a mass. Um, Leroy Chatfield, a former Christian brother, was the organizer of that mass. Uh, every night it was like orchestra. So, uh, you know, orchestration intentionally doesn't mean manipulation. It means being smart. And, and that combination was what was, what was so powerful. This is why Bobby Kennedy was so attracted. He combined that practicality with a certain kind of moral commitment that's very unusual. Usually it's one or the other. And we had both going here, and that's one reason it was so powerful. All right. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Una, Paola, ¿qué me dice Paola? Okay, and she she had her hand up. Um, yes, lady in the black. How come you only got the middle side? Not the side I have been looking, <laughs> and I saw no. Do we got I'm an undergrad. I'm an undergrad. I, I okay. Yeah, this is. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Let's shut the doors. <laughs> Stay here for 16 hours. Can you hours ask your question? Yes, please. sure. Thank yeah. you. And I'm an undergrad, so we got this. Thank you. Um, Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, I'm an undergraduate student. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. I am from Chile, um, and I was, I'm also always very glad to see um, big productions like this one being made about Latin Ameri uh, issues faced by the Latin American communities. And I was just wondering if Pablo and Diego are planning to make more films showing other Latin American issues in Latin American history or more current issues. Um, Gael Garcia Bernal was in the movie about the Chilean dictatorship, No? Um, and I was just wondering if you're planning to make more films like that, uh, maybe more about more current issues like the situation in Venezuela at the moment. Um, I was just curious about um, what your take is on this and whether you're interested in getting more involved showing the Latin American issues to the rest of the world. Are we? Well, <laughs> no, see. it's always been what we do. Uh, we've done films that always have to do with our stories and try to make them universal. And of course, we continue doing that. The next couple of films that we're making have actually to do with that, with you know, traffic of human beings and people from Chile that were killed in the United States, you know, people who lived through the dictatorship here in America trying to change that. Uh, so the other no version, the yes version here. Um, and it's what we do. I mean, Kanana has tried, I don't know if we managed to do it, but at least try to bring those stories and, you know, noise is an example of it in which we all did it together in this sort of brothership between the Chileans and the Mexicans and, the, you know, and try to put together stuff that looks like this. So that when you go and buy a ticket, you don't say this is a Latin American film, but you think this is a film and it happens to be that I'm on it. And that's what we're trying to change, that, you know, we're just normal people and we should, I mean, it's great to have Latin American film as a subject in school or Latin American studies, but it's just, we're part of the entire tamiz of what we are. And you, you know, the, the, I was very sad yesterday when, after the whole celebration, a journalist said on TV, this is the first Latin American director to win an Oscar. An Oscar. And I go like, what? Really? And, and suddenly, I started to think about how many conversations I've been having in Mexico, talking about cinema made in Hollywood as if it was evil and going to hurt us and, and we had to fight him. And, and suddenly I realized, well, part of that system are the Cohen brothers. Uh, well, a guy that works on that system is presenting a film here called Harmony Corin, that I think it's an amazing director. And 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 and, uh, and suddenly we've, yeah, we 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 shouldn't think about ourselves as the the 
the, yeah, the Latin American, the directors, companies, we are just telling stories. And stories should travel. Uh, when you're specific to a context, you suddenly become universal. Uh, uh, cinema is a mirror. You, and, and, and by looking at the story of someone else, you end up going through a reflection on who you are. Uh, so it's always going to be about us, you know? But I don't think, I, we don't think like that. We, we, we try not to open the newspaper to find what's our next film, you know? It's more about going through what you what happens to you in life what makes you cry what makes you sad when you get in love when it happened how it happened and then you start reflecting about something and that takes you hopefully to 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 a story so it's all about being honest with what connects you to the story you know and uh, we shouldn't be trying to put together countries or communities because then you're here four years later you sit down and you have to defend your film with someone that has a very strong opinion and <laughs> and if i didn't have a strong connection with this film i promise you i would be so depressed and go home and say what the fuck am i doing here <laughs> four years after i got paid two years ago that's it uh, but no the, the if the connection is strong if it's if you're telling something that matters to you and that is connected to who you are then the journey will be amazing whatever happens on the way you know so they'll they'll end up being about our connections with those things that matter but but we tell stories that should be about emotions and at least that's those are the ones i like you know that are that can, that, that i can go oh no no let, let's not do it in mexico let's do it in india yeah because it's so strong and we're talking about two people getting together or getting apart as simple as that no C can i say yes go ahead before you wrap yes. can i can i say something very important it's an amazing feeling to have a chance to discuss a film, uh, the work of four years with you guys. And uh, definitely, I have, I, being honest, it's been very nice. And it's, 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 it, it tells me, again, why this film matters, just by being sitting with you. And I appreciate your opinion. And I thank you for being honest. Uh, and I just hope we have this chance to discuss who we are for quite a long time. And we, we have one opportunity uh, to send um, a message to the film industry and the entertainment industry of this country. Uh, and that happens the 28th of March. And, and, uh, and this is not about making money, because in fact, money will be made by others. Uh, but this is about sending the message that we want to be able to portray our stories there. And if you can help us communicate that this film will come out at the same time that many other huge films that don't need your help will be out, <laughs> I would appreciate that because, uh, because it's been four years and we want to wake up the 29th feeling we have a chance to n explore and tell more stories. So please help us. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. As simple as that.